So today I'm excited about this. We have Mitch Stevenson and Jerry Ennett, and we're going to talk about robotics and navigation. So welcome, Mitch and Jerry. Thanks for having us, Stu. Absolutely. So we're going to go back and forth a little bit. This is not going to be a confrontational debate. This is more education for everybody out there. So why don't we just start with defining, you know, what robotics and navigation is. And so Mitch, define kind of what you view as, as robotics in orthopedics today. Sure. Yeah. So for me, there's like four things for robotics. Um, it's not, uh, is there a cutting tool at the end or uh, did we have some advanced imaging? Um, first thing is, can we define the patient's true mechanical alignment? That's number one. Uh, number two, can we get uh, soft tissue information pre-resection, right? Before we've made any bone cuts, can we uh, get the soft tissue information from that specific patient and understand what that is? Uh, three, uh, can we uh, manipulate the implants based off of that soft tissue information, right? To accommodate that and put the implants in in a more uh, kinematic friendly way for that patient, a uh, more personalized way. And then four, can we execute that personalized plan, right? Those are the four things that make up a robotic procedure to me. Um, and I know that probably feels very general to some people, but the truth is, uh, there really isn't anything outside of robotics that would allow us to do those four things, right? Um, and the, the main one being the soft tissue evaluation portion of that. Um, that's where things really start to change uh, for robotics. Um, and that's sort of what sets it apart. And then being able to execute that plan. Yeah. Okay. With that as our understanding, Jerry, kind of tell us what, what you view as the uh, definition of surgical navigation in orthopedics is? Sure. So I'm an engineer and a salesperson. So the engineer in me distinguishes between the two in a different way. Both are computer assisted surgery. If you're looking at nav and robotics, they're both CAS. Both require a patient registration, whether it's image list or image based, it can be both. Navigation guides the surgeon in cutting of bone, placing of implants, and pinning of cutting guides and blocks with visual information, robotics must take, as this is the engineering definition, a robot takes the electrical information from the computer and transforms it into physical motion. So whether it's haptic feedback and vibration of a vibrating motor or it's electrical energy converted into physical energy by moving a servo motor, that's what an engineering definition of what a robot is. Uh, so that's an active robot is moving. Um, the salesperson in me goes a little bit further in terms of, um, it's not exhaustive and it's not absolute. There are robot platforms that are changing the game, but in terms of arguing the benefits and drawbacks of these two systems, you kind of have to go with the trend of the big four. You're looking at uh, robotics tend to require a CT image, image list navigation doesn't, you might have, uh, robotics require an outlay of capital and annual fees. That's typically seen. And the best trend right now that's that I see shifting is you tend to have to be stuck with a single implant manufacturer. Um, and you know, there are platforms that are changing that, which is good, but that, when you're talking arguments against and for nav versus robotics, those are things that, that just can't go under the rug, I think. Um, but in terms of the engineer in me, it's, it's active or haptic feedback. There's something more than visual. So it's like a car, you're looking at Google Maps or you're looking at something that's more self-driving would be the robot side. That's kind of the an engineering based definition I see. Okay. So obviously there's some similarities here, as you mentioned, both are, are CAS. Um, but so let, let's move on as, you know, all three of us agree technology is going to become more and more prevalent in joint surgery. I mean, it, I think it would be foolish of any of us to say, no, it, it's going away. It will look far different 10 years from now, I'm convinced than it does today, but it's not going away. 
but yet there's continues to be papers out there, you know, that come up and say that there's no difference between, you know, navigation robotics and conventional mechanical instruments. You know, Jerry, we'll start with you is how do you, how do you combat that as the fight for, for navigation and tech? Yeah. So I think, I mean, that's something we always wrestle with for sure. I think, um, to quote like the Australian registry report, they, you know, the huge database, um, not tied to an implant manufacturer, not sponsored anything like that. So the, they quote saying the superiority of computer navigation to conventional TKA improving accuracy is well established. That's over 25 years. Robotics assisted TKA provides enhanced functionality as compared to computer navigation, but is significantly more expensive. Whether robotic assisted TKA offers any substantive advantages over NAV is yet to be conclusively proven, but irrespective of the form, the use of CAS in TKA and THA is on the rise and here to stay. So I think that's convincing enough that there's, you know, there's, findings that are substantial, that it's improving component placement to uh, another study I was just looking at was to levels of accuracy that aren't even like reviewable in mechanical alignment scenarios. So if you're doing it by hand, the idea that you're going to hit a decimal of a millimeter is not even like no one thinks you're going to do that. So it's established that you're improving the placement and cuts and soft tissue balancing, I think obviously the big argument is, is that improving PROMs? And that's kind of a big question that we need to see. Um, but there are studies that say that it doesn't. There are studies that say it does. I think that's, that's just for the sake of this argument, I'll use, you know, that, yeah. you know, uh, the, I can stop there and go nav after. Right. In right. terms, there there's both. Like that's kind of the the tricky thing is there's studies that say both. Um, I think it just takes time. Correct, and that is one of the challenging things about you can make papers say a lot of stuff. Oh, um, absolutely. But, so, Mitch, how do you kind of answer that question? And you know, as Jerry said, why basically why the future is, is that? I mean, why is robotics the future tech? And how do you yeah. respond to the same question? So those, the studies are interesting, right? Um, because essentially, whenever that gets brought to me, uh, why, why did the study show that it's the same? The first thing I want to look at in that study is, were we doing the same thing? And what I mean is, we're, we were hitting mechanical alignment in the manual instruments, right? And then when we use robotics, were we just hitting mechanical alignment again? Was that the goal? And if it was, and a lot of those studies are, um, we did the same thing. So why would we expect a different outcome? Uh, these manual instruments are great for me hitting mechanical alignment. I mean, if you, and if you understand how to manipulate mechanic, uh, mechanical instruments, uh, you're going to be really, you're not just hitting averages. You can really dial it in. Um, so if your goal is to just hit mechanical alignment, uh, that's why you're not going to see any differences in these papers. And that's why I harp on, the main difference, uh, the real power in the robotics is understanding the patient's soft tissue information before we make any cuts, right? We're not going to buy anything um, until we've understood that soft tissue information and understand how um, those patients' ligaments are going to react when we put this implant in. And what can we do beforehand to make sure we're not putting these implants in in kinematic conflict, right? Um I always go to uh, a specific type of knee, right? How do you handle that hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle valgus knee, right? How do we deal with that? Um, and how many times have we all been in a room when uh, a case is happening? Um, we make our cuts with manual instruments, right? Um, and that patient can't get to full extension, right? And so then we make a recut. Um, and before we know it, we end up with a... Uh, ultra constrained line or CPS or something like that, right? It happens a lot because that medial side is, is sloppy and we can't seem to figure out why. And it comes down to, we didn't understand that soft tissue information before. Um, and that's where things really change with robotics and navigation, right? Um, 
it's important to understand that there is no robotics without navigation, right? That being able to find mechanical alignment for a specific patient has to happen. Um, and that's where uh, navigation for me sort of ends, but that's where robotics built off of that. It said, look, if we can find this, what happens if we can understand how that MCL is opening and how that LCL is opening? Um, and if we know that information, maybe this patient uh, needs a couple degrees of varus um, and they'll be happier that way. And we've seen papers that show that, right? I mean, how, how quotes, you know, a, a, the big paper um, all the time of, you know, the patients that were in three degrees of varus uh, were actually slightly happier um, and slightly more satisfied. And so that sort of led us to understanding, okay, maybe we should understand the soft tissue a little bit more. And so that's why I always just say, if we're trying to hit mechanical alignment in all scenarios, we're going to get the same outcomes. Yeah. Well, it, again, all, all of this is fascinating. And even if you go back, you know, you mentioned he, he talked about three degrees of various patients were happier. It just takes me back to, you know, 20 years ago when there was no talk of kinematic alignment and, <laughs> and how, how our industry changes. Uh, but anyway, so moving on, we, we both know of navigation and robotic systems that require and don't require imaging beforehand. Um, what Mitch, we'll start with you this time, kind of what is the future in robotics around, do you want imaging beforehand or is that always going to be part of it or will we get away from that? It's a really good question, right? And so currently today, uh, every robotic system on the market basically uses the same camera. It's a camera from a company called NDI. Um, and so everybody is sort of constrained to the limits of that camera today. Um, there are some small different things that you could do to sort of change your accuracy levels, you know, by a half millimeter, half degree. But basically, everybody is two degrees and two millimeters of level of accuracy, and it's all sort of defined by the camera. So my point in bringing that up is uh, that limits us to what we're currently able to do. So, uh, you know, you've got one system out there that will require a CT scan, right? Um, that's because there's a cutting tool at the end. It's simply a design choice. You can't, you can't do something like, like they've got it without having um, high level of imaging uh, to be able to tell that robotic system where to cut, right? Um, now you're seeing more systems that have imageless options available. Um, pretty much all of the rest of them have it available. Um, and that's because you're having a problem getting those uh, images paid for. Um, and so what you're going to see in the future is higher level of cameras, right? There's cameras out there that are 100 times more accurate than what we're currently using. Um, and they can auto landmark and auto register, right? A patient's uh, bony anatomy. So with that being said, if we can auto landmark and auto register, where we're going to see this in the future is uh, there'll be image based options, but you won't need them, right? Um, you'll be able to get a snapshot of the patient's bone um, during your exposure. That camera will be automatic. Uh, it'll automatically be able to landmark any landmark that you want it to landmark, right? Um, and auto register that bone. Uh, so not only will uh, the process of robotics continue to get better with better cameras, but it's going to get more efficient, right? And that's when you're really going to start to see things change. I mean, a big argument against robotics right now is, uh, the, the added time, right? Um, which I, you can get to time neutral and you can get to faster as well. But the truth is it takes a lot of cases to be able to do that. And it's not just the surgeon. Uh, this is about the entire team um, and understanding, okay, when can I stand here? Am I blocking the camera? Who needs to be seen? When do I need to be out of the way? And once you understand that dance, then things start to get more efficient. But as we move into the future of robotics, um, the cameras are smaller. We're going to be able to get um, what we need faster um, and it will be more automated. Um, so I see it going away from imaging entirely, but that's because our cameras will be better. Um, and when our cameras are better, it'll make more sense to have a cutting tool at the end uh, because we could also auto landmark um, soft tissue structures, right? We could auto landmark the MCL, the LCL and not 
and, and tell the cutting tool, hey, do not cut these things, right? Um, so as we get better cameras, our automation will get better um, and we won't, we won't need high levels of imaging anymore. Yeah. So Jerry, kind of your thoughts with net future of navigation with and without imaging. Yeah. So I want to establish like, what is the goal of bringing technology into the OR? So whether it's whatever system you're using, you're looking for repeatability. So the surgeon wants to be confident that they're cutting, placing and pinning things in the correct orientations every time. We want to reduce outliers. My mom could be one of those outliers. I don't want her to have to have a revision. The surgeon wants the same looking post-op x-ray with no surprises every time. We want repeatability and that means accuracy is important. But what we got to agree on is clinically relevant accuracy is what's important. And I think now, like Mitch said, kind of two, two and two is what robotics are kind of accurate to this point. Navigation is more like three and three. Um, and if you, like if I'm an engineer designing a part for an engine and I need it to be tolerances of one millimeter, but I'm paying for it to be tolerances of one micron, I'm going to be fired because that's just an unnecessary expense. So you have to weigh like is CT and a robotic arm that's active costing 2 million bucks and $150,000 a year is all this worth one extra millimeter and degree of accuracy. So is that one millimeter clinically relevant is the big question. Um, I haven't been convinced of that and affordability is also a factor. So when you're looking at the future, I think CT improving accuracy is not necessary because I don't think three versus two is that important. What I think CT can do is reduce outliers in terms of image lists, navigation, um, registration. So there's going to be, you know, garbage in, garbage out is like a common thing against navigation and robotics. And if you have CT based registration for a nav system, there's going to be less garbage possible. The second way is precision, not just accuracy. So precision of a surgery matters. What are we aiming for? And CT based planning can maybe give you a better target for what you want your cut position or cuts to be at that can then improve a navigation system. The drawback again is you can't CT everybody, e economics, social status, insurance policies, add-ons, traumas, revisions, existing hardware, all those cases get forgotten about when you're talking just CT. So what I think the future would be is you know, maybe if there are cameras that are extremely accurate, that are auto AI based registering bony landmarks and things like that, maybe you don't need it. But I think in the near future, you'll see navigation systems and robotic systems, like Mitch said, that have options for both. I think it makes sense to have a CT registration for a nav system. I think it can maybe bring that accuracy closer to two and two if someone cares about that, but I don't think it has to be that way. And I think you forget about, you know, revisions and ETOs and hard cases are what can benefit the most from computer assisted surgery. When you're talking about a, if you're looking at primary hips, it's like 98% successful. So we're trying to innovate right. for that extra 2%. Well, revisions suck to be like, they're 30% of them require another revision or even more people don't even report properly on those. So it's like, I think whatever technology you're using, it should be applicable in all of those cases. Yeah. So, so I, let me touch on something with, sorry, Stu. Yeah, I just, go ahead. We brought up the cost of it. I think it's important to talk about that, right? Like I don't want to be on this, you know, with you guys and not talk about the cost of a robot, right? Yeah. So early on, uh, Jerry is right. It was 2 million bucks or you either want it or you don't. And uh, for me, that was a big challenge. How could we say that this is so great that everybody should be doing this um, and then hold that over people's head? Like, yeah, it's great and you love it, uh, but you better come up with 2 million bucks. The good news is uh, competition brings prices down, right? That's the beauty of our, our economic society. Um, as things get more competitive and there's more options out there, prices come down and more acquisition models arrive. Um, and so, very rarely 
is it a situation where someone lays out capital? If I'm just being honest, and there could be people all over the country that are going to hate to <laughs> that I am saying that out loud, but it is true. I mean, there are tons of options that do not require any capital outlay at all. Um, and frankly, uh, we figure out ways to to handle the the yearly um, maintenance fees as well, uh, which do exist. And I and I'm not going to hide from that either. Um, they do exist and they're necessary. I mean, these things need to be maintenance. Um, and if you don't believe me, let's go look at one that hasn't been maintenance for a couple of years. Uh, I mean, you tell me if you'd be willing to use it or not, uh, because you wouldn't be. It, it needs they need to be maintenance, but there's a reason why, right? Um, the reason why is we can hit mechanical alignment all day. Um, and we could try and even adjust from there based off of a patient's deformity, right? Okay, this is an eight degree varus deformity. Okay, let's just add a, a degree or two of varus. Well, the problem is, is we don't know what that patient needed, right? We don't know how many they needed. We don't know how much that medial side was going to open. We didn't know how tight it was. So it was sort of just a shot in the dark. Um, when the reality is, is if we have a machine that can give us the soft tissue feedback before, um, we can make more accurate adjustments. Any, any surgeon will tell you that's done robotic cases that there is no uh, plan that they use every single patient, right? None of their robotic beliefs are dogmatic. Like every single uh, case that you go into, a patient will get some sort of different alignment because everybody's soft tissue envelope is like slightly different. All three of ours on this call is probably different. Um, and so it's, that's what's interesting when you talk about kinematic alignment versus inverse kinematic alignment versus personalized alignment. You know, like there's all these different alignment techniques now that people use. Um, and I, you see them get used every day. Sometimes, you know, on one day, you'll use four different alignment techniques that you could have defined different ways for four different patients. Um, and, and that's where the value of the soft tissue information really, really shows. Yeah. So the, I'm going to kind of combine the last question here, the last two, because we've touched on some of it, but Jerry, we'll start with you kind of come up, What are the biggest shortcomings in robotics in 2024 and kind of sum up why people should use navigation? Sure. So I think like Mitch touched on the cost. So, you know, there's cap typically like if you were to see the initial pricing model, you're going to see a capital expense and annual fees. Um, when surgeons are shifting to a outpatient clinic, you know, profitability being a huge concern, these expenses are going to start, like they're going to have to change. You're going to have to convince partners to start 2 million bucks in the hole, or like he was saying, there's options. Well, a lot of them come down to like committing on volumes or, uh, like percentage of volumes being done. So you're having to convince partners to use a specific implant, um, in my experience, this is a big pain I'm seeing insurgents are coming to us with. Um, currently, most of them are non-agnostic. So you're looking at um, you know, partners and hospitals committing to a specific implant vendor, regardless of you know the recalls, patient preference, surgeon partner preferences, price negotiations. Um, you have that's like brings in versatility. So I think if you're going to bring in tech into your facility, you should be able to be with any surgeon, any implant, posterior, anterior, super path, minimally invasive revision, um, you know, regardless of social status or insurance policy, you should be able to, it, it, and it's not just a shortcoming for robotics here. There's SNAP systems that can't do this as well. And I think that's just an overall shift that I think we should strive for in the industry is to be able to do any patient, any procedure. Um, and like, we also talk about CT and stuff and I want to kind of remind, CT is not hundred percent perfect. You have, there's standard resolutions for like a, a makeoplasty case. You're looking at one millimeter up to one millimeter size slices and one millimeter spacing. So there's some variance there. Then you pro bony landmarks. You have some variance there. Then you're cutting bone with a flexible saw blade that can bend and deflect. Then you're placing a prosthesis that comes in only about 10 sizes and has angular tolerances for like ISO standards of up to five degrees. So we, if we're agreeing that 
computer assisted surgery can result in more accurate component placement and better patient outcomes. I'm still not convinced that actuating a robotic arm or providing haptic feedback is worth all the drawbacks. Um, if you're, when you're talking, you know, Mitch focusing a lot on something I agree with, which is soft tissue stuff. So getting soft tissue information, being able to plan on that in the moment, I don't believe I'm not convinced that's a robotic feature in and of its, like, it's not exclusive. It might be that a system now that can do that is a robot. I don't think that has anything to do with the fact that it has a robotic arm on it or that it is considered a robot. There will be nav systems that come out that can also do that. So I think to summarize like the shortcomings in 2024 specifically, there's just a lack of evidence clinically that justifies the expense, the locking of implant brands, the need for CT or the um, you know, to justify a millimeter more of accuracy for all those things. It just doesn't seem that there's the evidence there. Um, just to quote a study that was done in 2022 by, uh, by some surgeons and it was evaluating a, to leave the company out of it. It was a nav system and a robot arm system that both is owned by the same company. They did not find any significant difference between the computer nav versus the robotic arm in TKA um, when evaluating post-operative proms at any time between three months and two years. And they even said, given the alignment philosophy was the same, which is Mitch mentioned in both groups and potential differences in accuracies between the two systems are minimal. It's not surprising that the clinical outcomes are similar. So I think in terms of all the things that, the baggage that comes with a robot that actually has a robotic arm or haptic feedback or is doing cutting for you versus a nav system that might be, you know, mini agnostic free to use just cost per case on disposables. I just, there doesn't seem to be the evidence there that justifies it. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the things I want to highlight though, as well is I agree with Mitch that, the soft tissue considerations are lacking in NAV right now. There are ones that are coming out that do that do this. Um, and there's robotic systems that are coming out that are mini and don't require CT and things like that. So I think there's a convergence going on that, you know, if I were to say, what do I think the future looks like for these? It's like, okay, if first of all, economics matters. So, if you're a CEO of a hospital or a surgeon and you have an option to either buy a system that's accurate to three and three, don't need imaging, don't need pre-op planning, can be used by any surgeon, any operation, and you can save 2 million bucks to pay on staffing and training, you're probably going to increase patient satisfaction by not having overworked staff, better trained staff, all those things. Then increasing that accuracy by a millimeter. Uh, I just don't see the evidence against that. Um, and I just want to, I did also just interest sake, um, you guys might've seen, I, I know Mitch participated, I think Stu might have as well, but I threw up two LinkedIn polls the last few days on, you know, just to see what patients and surgeons thought. And so the first question was, what does success look like? A, patient is satisfied or B, the x-ray looks good. Um, every surgeon that responded selected A, that the patient is satisfied. And the second poll if you could improve one thing in your practice, would it be bony accuracy, component position accuracy, soft tissue accuracy, or decreased cost of the operation? Every single surgeon selected decreased cost of the operation. So patient being satisfied is what matters most to them and decreasing the cost is a big goal of theirs. So, you know, we're agreeing outcomes and patient satisfaction approved with tech. So we're gonna go past that for this argument. You know, a lot of the arguments I see is that getting a robot is a good marketing tool. I think that's a failure on nav marketing companies or, you know, marketing in nav companies that patients don't understand that being accurate to two millimeters instead of three actually makes a difference. Um, but I do see 
and respond to Mitch as well is there's a need to inc include soft tissue stuff. So I think that's a shortcoming of NAV um, and there's shortcoming on, on both sides. I think as you go, you're going to see the market kind of be saturated in terms of what robotic sales are looking like, and they're going to need a new system. They already have, you know, they have nav systems out there. They got to come out with robot systems to sell those. The big four, they're going to, you know, it's good. The robots are going to shrink. They're going to become handheld. They're going to be only in the sterile field. Like Mitch said, you're not going to have to stand out of the ways for the line of sight issues. You're going to reduce number of trays required to reduce infection risk. You're going to increase the speed of the surgery. And basically what I'm seeing is that's a shift to robots looking more and more like a nav system and whether it actually includes a robotic component at all. I just don't know if I take that to VAC, justify the costs of it, if it's not clinically relevant. That's my big argument is there are great robotic systems that can do soft tissue considerations. I don't think that's exclusive to having a motorized robot. I think a nav system can have that. I think you can have CT based nav and regardless of there's going to be a blurring of the lines that converges on something that is agnostic, any implant, any procedure, soft tissue and bone. My big question is, does the increased cost of having a motor in it to move something around or make cuts for you, is that justified? That's just what I have yet to see. Yeah. And as we've said before, I think all three of us agree that there's going to be more of a blurring of this. But as far as today, Mitch, kind of what are the biggest shortcomings you see with NAV? And why should people, if they're making a decision, you know, January 2024, why should they choose robotics? Sure. So Jerry said a lot of interesting things, right? Um, I, obviously, my biggest um, issue with NAV would be the lack of soft tissue evaluation. Um, because ultimately, if you had that, you could do uh, the same things that I've defined as a robotic surgery, right? And the reason I define that as robotic surgery is because it, robotics is the only way we can currently do that, right? And that's that's the value that I've seen and that um, the, the feedback that I've got from my surgeons that I've worked with, uh, you know, all over the Western half of the United States, that's the feedback that they've given me, right? Is the ability to, uh, to uh, understand the soft tissue information before we've made a cut, um, manipulate the implants to accommodate that and not put the implants in in kinematic conflict for that patient, right? That is the game changer. Um, have we seen studies that show that? There are certainly some out there that have shown um, patient satisfaction early on, less pain. Most of it's anecdotal, to be fair. Um, but anyone that you ask will tell you their patients are less painful um, and they just seem to do better. I mean, that is like almost a direct quote that um, I hear from physical therapists, surgeons, everybody, right? Um, then the other side that Jerry talked about, the, the marketing side of that, right? And uh, maybe it's a failure of NAV um, to not understand how to market themselves or what their advantage is. The problem was, is uh, for NAV, you're just hitting mechanical alignment. And so what is there to market? Um, People are doing the same because you're doing the same thing. Unfortunately, um, it's it's only going to be off. It's only going to be different, maybe by a degree or two, uh, based off of you know this patient wasn't on you know wasn't part of the average. They were slightly different. Uh, that's just not going to net you uh, a lot of results. Uh, yeah, as far as the cost is concerned, like I said, there's a lot of ways to be creative about that. And there's multiple different budgets for hospitals, right? There's capital budgets, operational budgets. And so when you're adding um, costs to the surgery, uh, you know, disposable costs or, you know, just a, a fee for uh, the NAV, uh, th there's economics surrounded by all of it, right? Just because one seems like a big capital outlay and the other doesn't, that doesn't mean one is more expensive than the other, right? Uh, there's costs to all of them. Um, the good news is we can be creative on the robotic side to figure out how to 
um, get you the machine that you want um, for a price that makes sense for the hospital and, and for what they're doing. Uh, I would say this, I, I think as we move into the future of robotics, there's definitely going to be um, some sort of blurring of lines, right? Things will look more mini. Um, things will look more like each other, um, you know, tomorrow than they do today. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> there will be more, in, there will be more systems that um, will be implant agnostic. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, if you're looking to do um, a different kind of implant on a different company's robot, you can call me. I've done it a lot. Um, I can certainly help you figure it out and they can be done. Uh, but in the future, that will be, there'll be more of that. And to be honest, I think the company that figures that out first um, and is willing to do that first will have a huge competitive advantage. Um, it's maybe the biggest complaint that I get uh, talking to surgeons. Uh, they would like to use the implant that they want to use. Um, the robot is just a tool. Uh, and they would like to use the implant that they want to use. And so I think that's where we're going. There's no question about that. Um, it's fascinating to me to see uh, startup companies and their whole thing is their robotic uh, platform that they've got. Um, it, it just shows you that this is certainly not going away. Um, you know, do we need uh, a robotic arm? Um, Jerry mentioned, you know, he, he doesn't think that we need to have a robotic arm that's moving and, and actuating and he's an engineer and I'm not, so my words won't be nearly as, as good as his, but the, the, the thing about it is we need some way to execute those plans uh, to an accurate level. And if we're going to move implants sub millimeters, we need to be able to execute that at the highest level that we can. And right now, the highest way for us to do that is with a robotic arm, right? And every company sort of has a different way of um, hitting that, uh, executing that plan, whether it's a cutting tool or blocks or, uh, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, everyone has a different way, but the point is we need to be able to execute that plan. And moving into the future, that will only become more necessary, right? Uh, as we start to integrate AI, into what we're doing um, with smart implants and smart sensors and everything like that, we're going to start to be able to phenotype patient disease, right? And we will understand, okay, based off of all of our information, this patient will need this type of alignment, right? Based off of their soft tissue information. So when we're moving into that, there's no doubt that we, if we're going to recommend a plan for somebody, we've got to be able to execute that plan. Like, Exactly. And so there's no way that we can't have a robotic arm or some way to execute that plan. Uh, in the future, it, the, the arm may look different, right? And in all fairness, the robotic arms that are out there right now uh, for orthopedics, they're old and uh, antiquated compared to the robotic arms that are available. Um, so there's certainly uh, more coming for robotics and it will change um, and it will get better. But we, there's no way that we could start recommending alignment uh, based off of uh, AI models, right? And other patients uh, without having a foolproof way to execute that plan. And whenever I say foolproof, it needs to be foolproof. If we're gonna recommend something, we've gotta be able to hit that target and know that we hit it. Uh, so I would just say the real shortcoming uh, for NAV is simply that it's just hitting mechanical alignment. And there's a reason there's so many different philosophies out there. Obviously, I'm not a surgeon. Um, and there's a lot of people who still believe in mechanical alignment and that that's the proven way. Um, but there's a reason that there are so many different alignment theories out there now, uh, because different things work. Um, and patients are extremely happy when uh, their knee and soft tissue envelope is not in kin kinematic conflict with their implants, right? We're making them feel more normal like they were before. Uh, so that, that, that to me is the biggest shortcoming of NAV is that it is, it's hitting mechanical alignment. And obviously you can manipulate uh, the implants to 
uh, fit sort of whatever alignment theory that you wanted, but it's without the soft tissue knowledge. And that's, that's the rub in my opinion is we need that information to be able to understand what philosophy should we be going with, right? Not, it's not the same for everybody. It could be standard KA uh, for patient A, but for patient B, it's inverse KA. And for patient C, it is mechanical alignment. And so we don't know which patient is going to be an outlier. And I can tell you it, hundreds of hundreds of times, the patient that you thought this was going to be a super easy chip shot mechanical alignment knee, it's not. Um, and it's totally opposite of that. And you don't have any way currently to predict that. Um, that's what I feel like are the biggest shortcomings. Yeah. Just to touch on one thing quick, Stu. Um, okay. So I just want to, like, most NAV systems are mechanical alignment. I did lots of kinematic alignment cases with NAV um, where the NAV system itself might not be measuring the soft tissue, but you can do that with uh, a second tool or new systems are coming out where you can do that with the NAV. Regardless, like we do, you know, lots of surgeries with kinematic surgeons. Um, just to clarify that. But the other thing too is one thing that you, I think we disagree on, but probably agree on deep down is you mentioned there's, it's almost like we can't agree on a knee philosophy. And there's, it's a 96% successful surgery for the most part there's tons of different philosophies i my most interacted linkedin post has like the five common ones that you're you're going to look at reverse kinematic all the different ideas and they're all different by a degree here and there and they all have potential for success and they are all successful 96 percent of the time depending on which one you're choosing and so when you say we need to move things sub like sub millimeter, we need to, if we're going to make a plan for someone, we need to be able to hit it exactly. Those are the things like if I were to pick two statements, those two statements I disagree with currently, just because I don't, I'm not convinced clinically by evidence that we do actually have to hit it sub minimal or sub millimeter accuracy to drive good patient outcomes. I think if I were, if, if I had a magic wand and I'm the CEO of a NAV company, I'm not going to try and hit sub millimeter accuracy if, or if I'm a robotics company, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and improve patient outcomes. Then I'm going to look at all the other ways I can, which is, you know, what happens in revisions? Why are revisions suck? Why are some people like serial dislocators, those other things, those aren't because the system couldn't execute a plan sub millimeter. Those are something else going on that I think if I only have a certain amount of time to invest, that's what I'm looking at. So I think that's just the the slight disagreement I have is we have 96% in knees, 98% in hips. If we have a plan and some people can't even agree what the plan should be or what the target should be, that's when I say, okay, well, I don't think we actually have to hit it to a sub millimeter accuracy with a robotic arm and a, a CT or bony or AI based super accurate registration. Cause I just don't see that actually improving outcomes. I would take that cost and invest in two more nurses or something that would actually maybe improve that or whatever it might be. That's just where I kind of draw the line is do we really need to hit sub millimeter if we can barely agree on philosophies and targets, but it's still a really successful surgery. I right. want to, it's a great, it's a great point, right? Like we can't, nobody can seem to agree on an alignment philosophy. Right. So that's where I think robotics to me is missing. Um, and the loop isn't all the way closed is we need to understand what is going on uh, after with these patients. Right. Which is where I would argue we need, the smart implants. We need to understand what is going on. We need that data. Um, my question would be, uh, Jerry, for you is if we're chasing a small percentage, right? We're chasing 4% that aren't successful, right? Um, 
if it's not going to be sub millimeter differences on that small of a percent, then what, what would it be? That is the problem, right? That's where my mind goes is we're chasing a very small percentage for a surgery that overall is very successful to your point. I don't disagree with that, but that's where I would say, I think the devil is in the details on this, right? Is that these plans were just not exactly right. That mechanical alignment or the average wasn't exactly right for this patient. And then as you take a broader look at it, right. And say, okay, these were successful, but you know, 16% of these people weren't happy. It was successful, but they're not happy. Well, why wouldn't they be happy? And that's where I think, okay, now you start to get a, a bigger picture of, okay, it has to do with the submillimeters. It has to do with the soft tissue. Um, that's where I go. We're chasing a small percentage and it's probably in my mind in the details, right? The submillimeters, it's just not exactly right. So, yeah. so I, yeah. The, la, la, last rebuttal, then we do have to wrap it up guys. We could do this all day. <laughs> my, my, my thought on that would be, yeah. So it's either in the details that, you know, if this was one millimeter one way or the other, would that 4% have been happy? I think you, the way I look at it is, you know, one thing you said is soft tissue, which I think is an emerging thing. So there's a robot that can do that. There are nav systems coming out and new ones, new features that can do that. I think whether that makes a splash, we have to see down the road, three, five, 10 years, we will see. But maybe those 4% or 2% in hip is soft tissue considerations. The other thing I would say is, I don't think it's millimeters. I think there could just be, those are outliers that computer assistance can, regardless of the system, can reduce. I also think something we can't forget about is 16, if 16% are unsatisfied, you know, you see this all over LinkedIn. I know you've seen those posts of, I just don't think those patients would be satisfied no matter what. I have sure. you know, at my CrossFit gym, a member, I talked to the surgeon, her knee went in perfect. It was, you know, she, had, she got a striker knee, looks great, everything post-stop, everything looks great. But she thought she was going to be able to do pistol squats and overhead squats by, you know, four months after. And so she's just, she hates it. She's very dissatisfied with it. That's where I'd be like, I literally chuckled because I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, you're probably going to be dissatisfied. <laughs> so I think that's consideration. I think when we're talking micro millimeters is one thing. So if you look at like ISO standards for a, an implant, you know, the angular variances in the manufacturing can be three to five degrees. And the millimeter differences are, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters of tolerances. So to, if we are talking about putting something at, you know, half of a millimeter accurate more than another thing, those implants better be manufactured to even more accurate than that. Cause you're looking at, you know, you have 10 sizes, so you're, you're not going to be a sub millimeter fit. And then you also have tolerances in the actual manufacturing of an implant that is not one micron. So you're going to be looking at, you know, if the angular variation on an implant's design is three degrees, then being accurate to one degree of an angle is not helpful because we just actually don't know what that implant's at. So that's, I don't think it's the sub millimeter things that you mentioned, but I do think it could be that soft tissue component. It's just yeah. something that's new. It's something we need to explore. It's, it's going to be coming out in evidence and it's, I agree with you on that. Yeah. That's well, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry, Mitch, I, I truly appreciate your guys' time. I appreciate the fact that you were both very respectful of each other's time. There wasn't talking over each other, so it was not like our the U.S.'s most recent presidential debate um, <laughs> four years ago. But I, I genuinely appreciate that. This is a conversation that obviously is important to our industry, and hopefully this helps some people out. So I, I appreciate both of you guys for doing this. Stu, I just want to say thank you to you for hosting us. Um, you know, this is something that we've wanted to do for a while. You and I have talked about it mm -hmm. back in July doing this and something we just wanted to do to open up the industry, right? And have an open, broad conversation. So thank you for having us. Um, thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. So 
All right, guys. I appreciate this. You guys have a good day and we'll talk soon. See ya. Thanks, Stu.